Are you a small business owner struggling to nail down your brand voice? Have you hired copywriters only to discover they couldn't capture your messaging? If that sounds like you, then you need to download my free resource, Discover Your Brand Voice in Three Easy Steps. Once you complete these simple steps, you will have a solid foundation for producing your business copy, whether you decide to write your own content or outsource it to a professional, like, say, me. As an added bonus, you'll be automatically subscribed to my email list, where you can learn more about my writing services and receive weekly updates about my podcast, Emotional Abuse is Real. Head over to the link in the show notes to grab Discover Your Brand Voice in Three Easy Steps today. Trigger warning, this podcast episode features discussions of multi-level marketing companies, toxic health and wellness groups, eating disorders, and unhealthy eating advice. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Emotional Abuse is Real. I'm your host, Serene Leeds. I'm a professional writer and storyteller, and I'm so glad you're here. For the second episode in my series dedicated to multi-level marketing companies and toxic health and wellness groups, I'm thrilled to welcome Lily Thrope to the podcast. Lily is a licensed clinical social worker in private practice in New York City, specializing in disordered eating and body image. When she was in college, Lily fell into a group that she now calls a, quote, yoga cult. While the group Lily joined wasn't a multi-level marketing business per se, you'll discover through our conversation that it held a lot of similar qualities to MLMs and cults. Fortunately for Lily, she had a good friend who helped her spot the red flags in this group, and she eventually walked away. Now Lily is here to discuss her own healing journey and her role as a therapist who helps others heal as well. But as always, before we get into the episode, I have a few quick announcements. Please make sure you're following me on Instagram at Serene Leads Rights and that you're subscribed to this podcast on either Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube. Also, don't forget to support Emotional Abuse is Real by leaving a five-star rating and by writing a review over on Apple Podcasts. If you're interested in sharing your emotional abuse experience on this podcast, whether it's for my series on MLMs or you'd like to talk about trauma from a personal relationship, please either DM me on Instagram, email me at hello at sereneleadsrights.com or fill out my quick and simple application form. I've left links to my Instagram, email, the show's application form, and my free download, Discover Your Brand Voice in Three Easy Steps, in the show notes. Last thing before we get into my chat with Lily Thrope. I live next to a fire station, so unfortunately there are two instances during our interview where the fire truck sirens are going off. My apologies for the unexpected noise. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Lily Thrope. So Lily, yeah, I'd love to turn the microphone over to you so you can share more about your experience. So what was this group? I mean, I understand if you can't name it by name. And what was it doing that made you feel emotionally abused? Yeah, so I think it needs a little context. So I Please. was in college at the time and I was, you know, I would consider that young. I was 18 and I went to this yoga class and I, I went to college in California at Occidental mm -hmm. College, very small mm -hmm. school. Um, mm -hmm. And I went to this yoga class. It was kind of branded as this like women's empowerment, let yourself like be free, let yourself be yourself. And I ended up loving it. And the instructor that I would go to the classes with was amazing. And really actually embodied this empowerment model. And I became so kind of obsessed with this. And I already had my own um, maybe disordered relationship with exercise. And this fit kind of perfectly into that. It was sort of like a yoga cardio dance. Um, it added a lot of elements that were this like feminine movements. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that was just so different. I had already been connected with yoga, but this felt different. And I remember sure. in one of my first 
few classes, there was kind of this encouragement of like, oh, take your shirt off, like practice in your sports bra, be comfortable in that. And I think I understand the premise, right? The idea that like we're letting loose and we're being comfortable and we're like being confident in our body and that all kind of fit in with what I was seeking as someone who was already kind of obsessive about eating and body image stuff. So sure. That did feel good in the moment, but I think Mm -hmm. looking back, I can see kind of how all of this played out to just make me feel connected with this in a way that was emotionally unhealthy, whether, you know, we can place the blame on anyone, but I think part of it is like that desire to be connected with a community. And I think that lures a lot of people in. It's like, we're disconnected. We don't have friends. Women especially want to connect with other women. So I think that kind of lured me in. So I ended up taking these classes for probably a year and a half. And then they were doing a certification for teachers in this Mm. particular program in the area. So I ended up doing that training. And again, I was maybe 19 at this point. And everyone in the training was in their 30s. I was the youngest person by far, like probably not the best group for me to be in. Everyone was lovely, but I was being exposed to some things that just like weren't appropriate for me. Mm -hmm. Um, But really the training was very, again, like emotionally just not appropriate. And at that time, I didn't even know that I wanted to be a therapist. I wasn't connected with that at all. So I was experiencing this training as just this amazing thing that was happening. And in the training, they also offered to meet the founder was running the training. So we met her and she was a part of it. Um, And I I have so much like peace and love for her because I think she has her own trauma story that probably Mm -hmm. led to some of this as well. Um, And that's me being overly empathetic with her. Um, But she led the training and also offered these like one offs where you'd pay, you know, $500 to meet with her directly (laughs) and learn like the special ways to just be happy or whatever. Um, And something I always joke about is if someone says that they're going to solve all your problems, run away, like actually run away. Yes. Yes. Because that is the telltale sign. It's like, meet with me for an hour and I'll solve your entire trauma history and I'll make your anxiety go away and you'll never have problems again. And I really And it will only cost you $500. Yeah. And this was years ago, so probably now (laughs) a thousand, but whatever. Um, And I I really wanted that to be true, right? Like I was an anxious, obsessive type of type A person and this was right up my alley. So I was counseled to become paleo, which was like their whole thing. It was actually grain-free, dairy-free, which is even more obsessive. So just for people who don't know, paleo is, you know, not eating any sort of grains or dairy, um, really just eating like meat and vegetables. That's like the main thing of it. Um, And again, I already had a disordered relationship with food. I I would call it an eating disorder at the time. And then this kind of pushed me even further into this like disordered behavior because now it was being told as this will solve your anxiety. Like I actually believe this was going to solve my anxiety that I had been riddled with my whole life. Um, Um, Yeah. Just real quick, because I don't know a huge amount about paleo. Like, is that considered a healthy diet for certain people? Or would you say that it's, it's not healthy for anyone? It's a tough question. As an eating disorder therapist, I want to say no, because I feel like Anything that's so restrictive and says this entire group of food is not good for you is a problem. However, you know, health is individualized and people need to find their own way to what feels good for them without being disordered. So I think just the idea of any food program that says don't eat an entire group of food without working specifically with a dietitian to learn about your specific food needs. If you're allergic to nuts, don't eat nuts, right. obviously. Of course. But, of course. you know, people aren't allergic to grains, typically, all grains. This includes oatmeal. This includes, like, any grain. You can think of rice, things like that. Okay. Um, so I, I kind of dove deeper into that. I, I started eating that way. In addition Mm -hmm. to eating that way, there was this protein powder that everyone in the training had. And it was, you know, again, that's the branded products. And we were told that the best way to use this is to have the powder with water. So for two years, I drank for breakfast a powder with water. And again, Mm -hmm. as an eating disorder therapist, as someone who's delved so deep into this, that is just not nutritionally good. That's not nutritionally. Yeah. yeah, It's not nutritionally 
fulfilling enough for someone to get through a day. That is not a good breakfast. And again, bringing back that obsessiveness, the group was very like, we're all doing this together and we all have to do this. And it was like, I don't know, there was this camaraderie around it. And again, I think I'm describing the pieces that come together to put you in a position to feel connected in this way. Yeah. Um, that's their power that these groups that that is their power it's the power of community which is why i really wanted to delve into this topic because i'm at first i didn't understand why people got involved with these groups but i do but i do now because everyone wants a sense of camaraderie definitely and it's very vulnerable so if you think yes. about a yoga Yoga generally is vulnerable, right? You're doing these poses that open your heart, open your Mm -hmm. hips. These are very vulnerable areas. So as part of the training, one of the things that we went through was the chakras. I don't know if you're super familiar with them. but am. Yeah. So for people who are not, there's certain areas in the body that we say like emotions can get locked in kind of that at certain times in your life, they develop all these things. You can look more into it. I'm sure there's tons of info out there, but yeah. One of the things we did was go through the chakras and we're in this group. We have all sweated together. We've all eaten this shake together. We've all done Mm -hmm. this stuff. And one of the questions that the person running it posed was, and and maybe I'm taking out of context, but just looking back on it, I can't see it in any other way than like really inappropriate was who here has had an abortion? And Uh, okay, it was that. Yeah, right. Like this is, to, yeah. So I think it was in context of the, like, um, the root chakra or something being kind okay. of affected, but regardless, okay. this personal question where one, we're already in this intimate group. We feel like we know each other, even though we met two days ago and now we're being asked this question. And again, I was 19. I was not familiar that this would be something that would be spoken about in this way. Yeah. And I think people felt pressure to answer because it's like you want to please this person you want to feel a part of the group some people were answering and then it's like do you lie like I think these were all honest good people and that's not something that anyone should have to share that didn't initiate the sharing and I think that type of question is not something that anyone who is trauma informed would ask so yeah I think what's tough is if you're developing a sort of cult-like mentality, you're, you can't be trauma-informed because the way to get people connected is to trauma bond and to yeah. create these moments where you think you're being vulnerable and authentic, but it's forced. It's a forced vulnerability. And that forced vulnerability is another thing that I would say, run away if you feel like that's being forced. Yeah. And what's fascinating about that particular question is using my limited knowledge of the chakras, I am in no way justifying or excusing, but I realize in the work that I've that I've done with my chakras with a couple of practitioners, I know you said, I mean, it might've had to do with the root, but um, what came to mind for me was actually the sacral. It, I think like that would be how they would justify that question. Like we're healing your sacral chakra. It might have been that. I honestly don't remember which one because I've become so disconnected, honestly, from that part of yoga. But yes, it could have been the same role. That makes total sense. What a manipulation, you know? Because I mean, when I let me put it this way: when um, a practitioner did a chakra healing on me, she did not bring that up. She did not ask me that question. I mean, that yeah, that that is the difference here. Totally. And I think to your point, it's one thing to say like, hey, I know someone in the group is comfortable sharing this and we're going to learn about the sacral chakra. Let's have that one person come up and let's talk through a trauma they've had. Like that is appropriate. You've discussed with the person, you've consented with them. This is more like who's willing to step up and share. And I think that can be just very, you put people on the spot. And I I think, again, no trauma informed provider would. And back to the people who are running these things, she didn't have any training in therapy. She didn't have any training in this. She's a yoga instructor and has some lived experience with being a person, but it's very interesting to look into the background of some of these people. Is there actually like real training around psychotherapy or mental health, or are they just using a coaching certification or a, um, 
yoga certification to say I'm also this like holistic practitioner. So so important. That's why I every single interview I do on this podcast, you thank you, Lily. You you've given me the opportunity to remind listeners I am not a mental health professional. I'm just a writer and a journalist and a storyteller who's looking to raise awareness of these stories. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's totally valid, right? You're wa- raising awareness. You're not saying, yeah. Lily, you went through this. You should do X, Y, and Z. And I think, again, so I will people, not do that. <laughs> yeah. People prescribing what's going to help you that don't actually have your best interest in heart. And it is hard to tell because people seem like they care. They seem like they want that for you. Yeah. It's really tough for people to actually want that if they're truly just profiting off you continuing to do more certifications and more um, products and all these different things. And I think that speaks to the, I'll call it a cult, but also that like MLM kind of vibe where you have then brand ambassadors who go out and also sell the protein powder and get a cut of that and, you know, all of those things. And I think a lot of these yoga programs have some sort of system like that, where if you can sell the things, you can get the classes free. And there's all these kind of weird connections that go on. Yeah. That's one of the reasons why I really wanted to do this kind of dedicated series. Because what started happening was uh, to build up my Instagram, I, listeners don't do this. I joined a follow loop. Do not do this. And the next thing I knew, people were coming after me trying to trying to tell me about essential oils, hair care products. And I started doing all this research and thus began my uh, journey down the rabbit hole of MLMs and toxic health and wellness groups. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. So I think to come back to the story, so I basically Please, was yeah. a part of this for a few years. I moved to New York for grad school. I ended up going to social work school, which was the best thing that happened to me. Yeah. Um, while I was there, I was connected with someone else in the group who was a dietitian that worked with mm. eating disorders. And we kind of were questioning some of the things going on. Like we were like, why are we doing it this way? This feels weird. There's some nutrition advice that's being given that's not appropriate for people who might have issues, right? They might have other medical issues that aren't being disclosed. And now they're getting medical advice from a not medical professional, right? Or they're getting nutrition advice from someone who's not a certified registered dietitian. So right. my friend, you know, noticed some behaviors in me and she said, "Hey, I think you have an eating disorder. I think it's being shrouded as this health thing because you're in this yoga program, you're doing their diet, but I really see some disordered things." And that allowed me to really zoom out and notice what was going on. Like her reaching a hand out and pointing this out to me. Me and her are still very close colleagues. We work together consistently. What a Um, good friend. Yeah. Her name's Katie Cordino. Her um, practice name is Full Soul Nutrition. She's amazing at helping people work through their own trauma with food. And we really came together to help other people in this group see what was going on and support them in processing the trauma around it. So I think we still work very collaboratively together with eating disorders and many other things. Um, but having her just point that out to me really clued me into what was going on. And I started to recover. I moved away from this practice that the practice went through its own drama. Like there were other people who started reporting traumatic events that happened. The founder started her own like therapeutic method that she was doing. Um, and there was like a specific Instagram account that was dedicated to people posting, their traumatic stories with this practice. So there Mm -hmm. were some communities that came out. They were all anonymous. And I think people are still anonymous. And some people did speak out publicly. Um, It's just, it's really tough when you loved the community. Like I think when I talk to people, the biggest thing I hear is I miss the community. I Mm -hmm. do miss those Mm -hmm. weekends where we'd go away and we'd exercise for eight hours a day and like be together. And it was so vulnerable, but it wasn't. It wasn't. Right. And there's always right. going to be this kind of trauma connected to that community, yeah. for me, yeah. at least. So, I mean, was it easy for you to leave the group? I mean, did you get any pushback from the founder or the people that you interacted with? Or, yeah, what was it like for you? 
I feel like I got lucky because they actually opened a studio in New York City and it did really poorly. So I was involved when that opened, but it didn't take off. And I think that's when a lot of drama started happening. Okay. So I kind of quietly quit. I kind of just like slipped away. Um, I had never gotten so high up that I was like needed, if that makes sense, which is very <laughs> lucky. Yeah. Um, there's other people who like worked in the studio. Like I worked in the studio very little. I was in grad school. I was doing so much else, which which protected me, I think, from being so available to just like yeah. be so be like, no, like, I got no, I got school. Totally. Yeah. There were people yeah. that were fully running the studio and like yeah. being underpaid, being abu- all these things. I luckily wasn't involved in that. So I kind okay. of scraped the surface, but I was able to kind of quiet quit and just slip away. Um, okay. There wasn't a lot of pushback because I actually don't think I was doing a good job at the MLMing or whatever and like, promoting <laughs> it and doing all that. I didn't have any sort of following. Like I wasn't really pushing it. Um, I did a few classes that got some good turnouts. Like I did a pride class. I did like a Memorial Day class or whatever. And those were my few events that I had done. But I didn't teach consistently at that studio, which I think okay. really, again, saved me from not getting so involved. That's wonderful. So yeah, I would love to hear about what your healing journey has been like. Yeah. So after my friend pointed out my eating disorder, I ended up getting connected with a therapist and a dietitian um, who was a certified intuitive eating coach. So I don't mm-hmm. know if you've heard of intuitive eating. I'm also a certified intuitive eating coach now, but it's great. No, um, I'm not familiar with it. And uh, I don't know if my listeners are either. So yeah, I'd love to hear more about what that is. Yeah. So intuitive eating was developed by two dietitians in, I believe, 1995. Mm-hmm. And it's a kind of revolutionary way to look at nutrition around coming back to this sense of intuitive nature that we have to know what we need to nourish our bodies, mm-hmm. while also acknowledging the ways in which diet culture has created a lot of rules around food. So yeah. the fir- there, there's a step of 10 principles that are amazing. And if you look on... Um, the intuitive eating what actual website, they have the 10 principles there. The first one is rejecting the diet mentality. So the quickest way I can describe this is when you're a baby and you're looking for food, you're just searching for whatever you're craving. So that might be like a stick of butter because you're low in fat and you need fat to grow. Um, As we age, we're told that's not healthy, that's not this, and we lose that intuitive sense to know what our body needs. So this is a way to come back to learning what your body needs while also honoring satisfaction, which could look like choosing to eat a cake because you are celebrating something or eating a cake because you're just in the mood for that. So there's a balance of nutrition, intuition, and satisfaction, I would say is like the best way to describe it. So I ended up working with a dietitian to develop some of my own intuitive eating skills, let go of my rigid rules that I had around food, and also develop a healthier relationship with exercise. I actually mm-hmm. took a year off from exercise. And I know that- oh, wow. What really, was that like? It was really powerful. Like Exercise had been the thing for me that helped me avoid all of my own anxiety and- it, and depression symptoms and eating disorder symptoms, I just run away, literally run away from it. And not exercising put me in a position to actually feel the emotions I was having and learn other skills to emotionally regulate. That's great. There's nothing wrong with using exercise to emotionally regulate, but if it's your only way Right. Similar to these programs, if this is your only way to connect with people, it's a problem. So I think developing more than one way to work with your emotions has been so impactful for me. Staying connected with certain people who were able to get out of this community has been really healing. That's um, great. I know this sounds weird, but watching sort of like the Nexium documentaries like <laughs> makes me feel good. Like just knowing that so many people fall into these kind of things. It's not it's so true. stupid people. It's not no. um, people who can't see what's coming. It's people who want to connect, people who value empathetic, emotional connections with other human beings. That is the type of person. 
You know, I'm really glad you brought up the Nexium documentary because I'm always curious and I'm sure that this varies from person to person. Like, is it something that you would enjoy or is it too painful? Is it too triggering? Personally, I enjoy it. Um, this is yeah. a crazy offshoot story that I did not anticipate sharing today. But in my college, we actually had Mark Elliott come speak. And I don't know if you're familiar with Mark Elliott, but he... I don't has, think I am. Because at first I was like, no, he's not. No, he's not the Nexium guy. Right. No, he okay. is. He's part oh, of he Nexium. Is, so is I know. Because I was connected. like, I, I, I remember Keith Ranieri, but okay. That's like the okay. main guy. Okay. So right. Mark Elliott it, wrote a book, What Makes You Tick, which is an awesome okay. book anyways. I haven't read it in you know 15 years, but I read that book. I met Mark Elliott at this thing, and it turns out he's part of the Nexium thing. And I think I don't know if he's right. still defending it. I think he might be, but basically he claims that Nexium, their programming helped him cure his Tourette's, which was a big thing that they touted. Was like this program helped a lot of people cure their Tourette's. I'm not okay. up on all the you know ins and outs of that, but he was one of the like outspoken people who would go to colleges and talk about curing his Tourette's by take, doing this program. So okay. he spoke at my college. I have the book literally on my bookshelf signed by him, like to uh -huh. from I loved him. He was a yeah. great speaker. And after the event, they said, anyone who's interested in learning about this program, stay. And of course I did because I liked him and I was, yeah. you know, enamored by him. So yeah. I stayed and they gave us this paperwork and they're like, go home and talk to your parents and see if you can join this, like pr this a uh, healing program or whatever. Um, and of course I did. I went to my yeah. parents and I was like, I want to do this thing. Yeah. They were like, absolutely not. We know this thing. <laughs> it's not good. It's a cult. It's a problem. Like, no. Yeah. And thank yeah. God for my yeah. parents. True yeah. shout out to my parents. Yes. They knew about this from years ago and they were like, no, absolutely not. Right. So thankfully I didn't go in that route because then we'd be having a very different conversation. We would. But yeah. that's just a very ironic like offshoot that like he went to colleges to recruit college students. Like, again, this is not unintelligent people or right. like low income people or anything. This is really intelligent, really good natured people that are being curated by yeah. colleges by all these different things so anyway this is, what, that this is what's so scary and insidious about these groups and these people and no and thank you for sharing that that is crazy and yes shout out to your parents indeed definitely yeah. so whenever i do watch the nexium stuff it really makes me feel grateful that i didn't get involved with something worse like if this was the thing that i had to get involved with i'm you know, grateful that it was what it was and I got through it and I found this community and I healed. And I think in the same time that I was healing, I was also in social work school, becoming mm. a social worker, not okay. knowing exactly what I wanted to do with my experience. But I, you know, did a lot of different things and then ended up in private practice, helping other people heal from yeah. specifically eating disorders and disordered eating, which often does come out of these types of like yoga cult environments. So I think yeah. I still have this connection to helping people pull themselves out of these intense beliefs that they have around something. And that could be from an emotionally manipulative parent, an emotionally manipulative diet culture, an emotionally manipulative society that makes us believe that there's something wrong with us and we need to fix it. So I think that's the way that I bring it into my work is like, we are not problems to be solved or fixed. So when a yeah. program is saying, I'm going to solve or fix you, it's not true, right? Therapy yeah. doesn't solve or fix people. It helps them get comfortable in discomfort and sit with the emotion so that they don't have to run away to these programs to feel like they can achieve whatever it is they want to achieve. And I think that's the way I've really connected it to the work I do today. I'm so happy to hear that. I mean, I love the idea that you've taken your experience and use that in your work and have helped people who have experienced the same things that you have. So thank, thank you. And I think that that's a really healthy way to work through uh, what you went through. So what are some red flags 
when it comes to these particularly insidious groups. So what are some red flags that people should look for? Because it's true. I feel like so many people who get, who are emotionally abused, who get involved with these kinds of groups, the first thing they always like to say is, I'm an intelligent person. Like, I'm smart, but yet this still happened to me. Totally. Yeah. I think I've mentioned some, so I'll you circle have. back to some of yeah. those. I think some of the red flags are, what are their credentials? So, yes. you know, as a therapist, I have to do continuing education. I yeah. look at the credentials of the people. Are they credentialed in my field? Yes, because mm -hmm. if they're accredited, they would only be allowed to do these talks if they are actually credentialed in the field. Yeah. Where did they get their training and education? Where are they pulling from? So that to me is like the first thing I always take a look at is like, do a quick Google search, get to yeah. know the person. If there's not a lot of information on them, that's probably a red flag. So yeah. that's the first thing I would think about. Yeah. Um I think also just acknowledging, are they saying they can solve your problem, right? I've said yeah. that a few times, but yeah. if they say we solve infertility, no uh -huh. one solves infertility, no. right? No, no. That's not something that can be solved. So I think no. this idea that like, take our course, take our program and we can solve it for you. That's another red flag. And yeah. I was actually talking to some colleagues this weekend and they were saying that this is something that business coaches are doing too now. So on Instagram, mm -hmm. you'll get a message like, I can help you grow your business and here's what I do. And if you have to buy into these programs and then beyond that, buy another course and buy another course, they are actually just doing what they say they're going to do for you to you. That's what they're doing. I love that you brought that up because I am immersed in the online business world because I'm a, because I work for myself as a writer. Um, and I don't want to be that person at all. Um, I, and also because I went to graduate school. So anytime I see these business owners saying, take my course, take my course, I'm just like, no, I can't because I already spent thousands of dollars going to grad school. I already know how to write. <laughs> totally. Like, a yeah. great, I mean, a good example would have been if I reached out and was like, I want to be on the podcast. And then you were like, oh, it's $300 to be on it. Right. Like, right. Exactly. That's something that I think people are being bombarded with daily is, hey, I can help you. Yeah. But then it costs money. If someone wants right. to actually help you, it's not going to be so that they can get more money and profit off of you continuing to take their courses. So maybe that's yeah. a more nuanced red flag that's a little hard to see. It but is. I it think is. that's another one that I would look for is like, look at their page. Are they selling consistently? Are they continuing to sell courses that they've created? Is this actually just something that they are profiting from. And listen, yeah. there could be some amazing resources. And you know what I say? Take advantage of all the free stuff. A lot of these people offer the free content. Take the free content. That's great. But be really particular and selective about the people that you actually invest your money in. Like, is this Absolutely. someone that you really, really, truly believe can help you and has your best interests at heart? If not, again, run. Like if totally. they don't truly have your best interest in heart, not the best interest of the whole, like just you, then they are not the right person for you. I just, I want to dovetail off that just to remind listeners that I will only push, and I don't even want to use the word push, my my free stuff, my free download, my my free email list. I would never do something like that because it is so off-putting. And most times if someone approached me with that kind of a hard sell, yeah, I would, I would walk away immediately. Totally. Yeah. And I think if you really believe what you're doing is good, you don't have to sell it. I'm, I didn't go to business right. school, so I don't know if that's true, but you yeah, know, neither did I. <laughs> like, I don't think therapy needs to be sold. Everyone knows what it therapy is be. for. If people yeah. are reaching out, it's because they want therapy and they already know the benefits of therapy. It's not the same as I'm selling a course to show you how to build your business. So I think yeah. also just being thoughtful about like, what do you need? You know what you need inside of your own gut. But if you're reading yeah. all this stuff on Instagram, then you get convinced, I also need this other thing. Take a step back. 
get off Instagram, get off TikTok, look inside and decide what type of support do I need? Is it a therapist? Is it a coach? Is it a yoga program? Then once you've decided what you want, do your research and find, is this an accredited program? Is this right. funded by people who I respect and go from mm -hmm. that kind of place? Yeah. Um, I know that I just wanted to say, no, thank you for just recapping that. Cause I know you spoke about those red flags in your story, but the way podcasts work, it's always a good idea to recap. So everyone has all of those red flags to refer to in one place now, because we talk about what what is so alluring about these groups, which is the sense of community. Are there any green flags that people can look for in order to find a healthy community? That's a great question. I think free groups. So mm -hmm. I live in New York City. So obviously there's tons of free options. You know, there are, I, I've, I've not been to this, but I hear there's this walk that someone created that's like girls who walk or something. And uh -huh. it's just a bunch of women who show up in the park and they walk in Central Park. Like, oh, I love it's free. it. They're not selling. Oh I mean, don't quote me on this because yeah. I don't know, but right. they're not selling anything. I don't think, right. you know, maybe at some point they'll have t shirts or something, but there's a lot of free communities. Um, I actually ran a half marathon for in, in February and I joined a free community. It's called the Slow AF Run Club. I don't know if I can <laughs> curse on here, but oh yes, um, you can. Absolutely. Yeah, I think everyone knows what AF means, but it's yeah. <laughs> run by, you know, someone who just created this free online community and you don't have to pay to be a part of it. So That's great. I think those people are putting out genuine bouts of like connection. They're like, hey, I actually want people to just connect and this is free. They might also offer coaching or something, but they actually allow you to join the community for free. I think mm -hmm. that shows that they value the community first. And yeah. then, yeah, sure, if you end up loving the community, buy a t-shirt and you know, buy this or whatever. So I think utilize all the free things out there. Utilize listening to podcasts. Utilize mm -hmm. finding other people who listen to that same podcast. I know there's Facebook groups for people who all listen to the same podcast. Search for things that are free in your area. There's so many free offerings. Start there and then branch out. You can find community for free in your area if you look for it. Absolutely. Uh, that's wonderful advice. And I feel like I've never actually said this on the podcast before, even though I always uh, list in the show notes ways to connect with the guests. If anybody wants to connect with anybody who's appeared on this podcast and you like miss the show notes or whatever, shoot me an email, DM me on Instagram, and I will happily connect you with that person unless they're anonymous. Then I would have to check with them. But uh, yeah. Oh, that's, that's awesome. What advice uh, would you give to people who may be involved with a toxic health wellness group or, or an MLM and, you know, they may be listening and they know that they want to leave or, you know, what would you recommend would be their, for their first step? So I, I think if you are part of something that you're not aware is problematic, that's yeah. a tough one. But yeah. if you're there and you're noticing some subtle things, you're noticing some signs that this isn't for you and this is actually harming you, find someone who is outside of the community to talk to and okay. let that person know, I'm not sure how I feel about this but I want to tell you some of my experiences and I want to hear what you think of them. I mm -hmm. would do this with a person who you know can stay calm, stay cool, help you look at the information in front of you and decide if this is harmful, right? Like just yeah. help you decide. Because sometimes people say, I don't know if this is harmful. I have so sure. many clients who go on a date and one small thing happens and they're like, is this a problem? I don't know. So you might right. need another person to help you figure out, is this part of a manipulation tactic or is this genuine? And don't get down on yourself if you don't notice it, right? Like it yeah. is okay to not notice it. We want to connect as humans. That's our number one driving force is connecting with other people. So Absolutely. it makes sense. Just give yourself a trusted, supportive person to talk to. That could be a friend, that could be a parent, that could be a therapist. So 
I would say the first thing is to run some of this by someone else just to get clarity for yourself. That's a great idea. Thank you. Is there anything else that you wanted to share about your experience or any advice that you would want to give about this topic? I think just emotional abuse is real and it does happen yeah. all the time. And I think it's happening today. It's happening tomorrow. It's happening five minutes from now. Notice yeah. in your friends and family also when you see red flags too. Like there can be people who pull you out of it. So I think my friend pointed it out to me. Um, there definitely can be people. I think there's a way to go about that without um, minimizing their positive experiences there and just saying, hey, I noticed these few things. I'm, you know, we don't have to get into it, but I want you to just see that this is happening. And yeah. I don't think the way is by saying to them, I'm not going to be friends with you if you do this, right. but more of that feeling of, hey, I'm here for you. I see this. If you ever want to talk, I'm here. And that's it. Just reaching yeah. out, giving someone that space. Obviously, you doing this podcast, giving people a space to share their stories. I think this is so important. This is what allows people to realize, oh, maybe what I'm going through isn't healthy, isn't normal. That's exactly why I started this podcast because, you know, you listen to my story. Um, I went for years uh, of, of people just dismissing my experience. And I was just like, no, it was real and it needs to be discussed. So thank you. Uh, Lily, how can our listeners connect with you? So I'm on, you know, the Instagram. You can the connect Instagram. with me at my <laughs> Instagram name is my business name, Throp Therapy. So my last name is a little hard to spell, but it's T-H-R-O-P-E, Therapy, L-C-S-W. And then my email is just my first name, Lily, L-I-L-Y, at thropetherapy.com. Um, you can definitely email me. I respond to all my own emails. You can DM me. I run the account. I'm happy to talk to you there. And then also my website is thropetherapy.com. So I'm pretty accessible in all those areas. Again, I'm happy to talk with people. One of my favorite things about being a therapist is actually connecting people with the right therapist. So yeah. a lot of the calls that I do are actually, hey, we're not a fit for you or we don't take your insurance, but let me connect you with some really trusted therapists. Because the number one thing I hear when I meet with a new client is, I had so many bad experiences with therapists. So yeah. if you ha are that person or if you need a new therapist, I'm happy to connect you with some of my colleagues who are really trusted, amazing therapists. Um, and I have a pretty big network of people who specialize in a lot of different things. So happy to help with any of those things for any of the listeners too. Uh, thank you so much for saying that, Lily, because I... Finding the right therapist is a lot like dating. I say that a lot. And the right therapist for you is out there, but you're not always, and I can speak from experience, you're not always going to find them on the first try. So uh, thank you for sharing that information. I will leave all of that in the show notes. And Lily Throbe, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today and sharing your experiences and your thank insights. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to my conversation with Lily Thrope on Emotional Abuse is Real. If you would like to connect with Lily, I've left her website, email, and Instagram in the show notes. If you would like to be a guest on the podcast, please don't hesitate to reach out via email at hello at sereneleadsrights.com, through Instagram at sereneleadsrights, or fill out my guest application form. Please note that this podcast should not be used as a substitute for professional mental health services. If you are a victim of emotional abuse and need help, please call or text the Suicide and Crisis Hotline at 988 or call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-7233. You can also text START, S-T-A-R-T, to 887-88. Once again, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts. Follow me on Instagram and go grab my free download, Discover Your Brand Voice in Three Easy Steps. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll see you next time.